Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, Mysterious Voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out-of-the-ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Well, it is time for another uh, Short Story Tuesday, a wonderful day to talk about the short-form literature that exists in the world, and I have found an interesting and well-written story today. It is about trains and parents. I am referring to Overashki's Trains by Laura Vapniar, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, which was published in 2003. Overashki's Trains comes from her short story collection, There Are Jews in My House, quite the interesting title. Uh, I'll leave you to read it and figure out what, uh, what she means in that particular story. Uh, which I found this for my local library. Don't forget to patronize your local libraries. They have cool and interesting books. For those who don't know about Laura Vapniar, she is a Russian writer um, who immigrated to the United States when she was 18 or 19 years old and began writing in English. Um, and since, uh, since about 2003, when she got her first story published, uh, she's been writing since the past 20 years. She's um, been writing short stories as well as um, longer novels. Uh, and she's, I, I think I mentioned this already, but she's won a couple of awards for her work. Uh, and so, yeah, she's an interesting writer. I certainly enjoy her prose, which I'll talk about in this story. Um, and I look forward to encountering more of her work in the future. Uh, but let's talk about Overashki's Trains now. I will do a summary, a little bit of an analysis, and we will move on from there. So Overashki's Trains focuses on an unnamed narrator, a child about five years old, living in Overashki, Russia, during uh, a particular summer. Uh, they are living with their mom, their grandparents, uh, and their landlords, which I think is interesting and I'll mention later. Um, I don't know if that's a Russian custom or if it's um, just something to do with how poor the family is, but I, I do think that's... Um, something worth noting. Uh, noticeably absent from this family is the father, which the narrator talks about uh, how they're uh, waiting for their father to come home. As their mother last said, their father was at a business conference or something like that. Uh, so the, the child who I don't think it's specified if they're a boy or a girl, uh, but the child is hanging out in a garden, uh, which is near a fence, which is near the uh, uh, the train station that they live by, because they live in a house where trains pass by constantly, uh, and, and it rumbles the house, an indicator that they're a poor family too. Uh, so again, yeah, so the child hangs out in the garden, looks uh, as the people come off the trains, looking for um, their father in order Order to welcome them home. Uh, but unfortunately, with each passing train that comes by, the narrator does not see their father and they begin going through their father's things um, to, I guess, to feel a connection to the parent that isn't there. This goes on all summer and the narrator notes that some days feel incredibly long and some days feel uh, unbearably short. Uh, and at the end of the summer, the narrator and uh, their family return back to Moscow. And it's at this point where the mother brings in the, the father's brother and tells the child that you're old enough now to know that your father died of a heart attack four years ago. Uh, and the narrator is, is really sad upon learning this, as I'm sure anybody would be sad upon learning this. And so uh, during the next summer, when they move back to Overashki, instead of sitting in the garden looking or waiting for the trains, the narrator chooses to hide under the porch. And as the story ends, the narrator notes that they're covering their ears every time a train comes by, an indicator that um, they've, they've come to associate the trains with their father. And now that their father is never coming back, the trains are a bad memory. So that's where the story ends there. In terms of analysis, there is still quite a bit uh, to decipher within this incredibly short story. Uh, one thing I think is interesting is how Vapniar illustrates a life in poverty pretty well through this story. Maybe it's through her own personal experience, uh, or it's just she's a, a, 
a really good writer who knows how to illustrate these kinds of things. The way she does it is uh, the small house that they live in. The, uh, the narrator notes they live in a narrow room. Uh, and where is this house but right by the train ta train tracks? I, I, I would guess that, you know, houses right by the train tracks where it's noisy and uncomfortable at times would be pretty cheap and affordable in terms of rent or even just in, in their cost. Um, the family has... Um, the family lives with landlords, so I don't know if that's a Russian custom, but again, if you live with your landlords, that's a, that's an indicator that one, your landlords probably aren't that wealthy, and two, uh, you're you probably like are trying to find the the, the easiest way to uh, live and the cheapest way to live, and that's with with a group of people. Uh, and also, they they uh, the narrator notes they live with their grandparents, so multiple families. Again, that's that's probably Russian custom, but it also makes things a lot cheaper for this family because they don't have a lot. And they also have a garden, which again, this could be a Russian custom, but uh, growing your own food is certainly a lot cheaper than buying it at a market. And so uh, you can see how. Um, that might be a, a way to help them afford other things in life. Uh, but what I like about this is how it serves uh, as a good way to show that the, the narrator and their family are poor, but it also kind of serves as an early indicator that the father might not be coming home. Either they left, um, uh, just abandoned the family, and the family doesn't have that much money anymore, or more realistically, the father just died, and the the mother had to move back in with her family part of the year in order to make ends meet. And I like how uh, Vapniar, you know, kind of hints at that uh, without actually saying it in, in the early part of the story. But then at the very end, she just says it, and I feel like that's a, that's a, a point away from this story, just because... Um, like it it's really solid and um like Vapniar like like she doesn't need to tell you that the father is dead but she does anyway and it's like okay I could I, I saw the writing on the wall you don't have to spell me out spell this out for me I'm not stupid and um like it doesn't like that this is the only one where the story where that pops up in the story where it seems like she doesn't trust the readers to know what's happening uh, so it's it's not like this is a, a consistent problem in her writing. It's just a problem with this story. And it, it's not enough to take away my enjoyment of this story um, or how somber the story feels. But I do wish she would have like left it unsaid that the father is dead and left it more to, I don't know, speculation or something like that. And another thing worth noting in this story is the the existence of the trains and how they serve as sort of a, an analogy of, of hope for the narrator. Uh, the narrator waits for the trains because they believe that the narrator or that the trains will bring the their father to them. So the, every 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 arrival of the train, every time someone comes off off the train, they it, it serves as hope that their father might return to them after their long unexplained absence. Uh, but at the same time, I do find it interesting because the narrator notes that they wait in the garden and they, they try to make it look like they're not looking at anything. Like they don't want their grandparents or their mom or the landlords to even know why they're in the garden looking at the trains. So I, I, that, that raises a lot of questions for me. Like, is it a personal obsession of the narrator? Like only they're allowed to, to be searching for their father. Like only they're allowed to care, only they are allowed to care about the trains. I'd say that might be uh, something that's going on for the the narrator. Although they're five years old, so I don't think like sir, like that would be on their mind. But another thing is maybe they don't they they already know the what what happened to their father, how their father died of a heart attack, and they don't want to really learn the truth. Like as long as nobody knows what they're doing, as long as uh, only they know why they're in the garden looking at the trains. Uh, they they won't learn the actual truth. Like they can distance themselves from from this uncomfortable knowledge. Again, the child is five, and I don't think that that uh, that's something that would be going through a child's mind, or even like going through their subconscious as a way to try to avoid the truth. But it is an interesting idea because. There, there has to be a reason why the, the narrator doesn't want others to know. Maybe, maybe it's just a special relationship with the father. Uh, and even um, what's, what's even more interesting is after learning 
uh, about what happened to their father, the narrator starts to avoid trains. Whereas before they represented hope, at the end of the story, the narrator is hiding underneath the porch. They're trying to go as far away as possible from the trains as they can, and it's it's not helping. Uh, there's a the narrator has a, a a deep sadness that I think is um, exemplified by by the quote I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about. Yet from under the house, I could still hear the muffled sounds of trains. When the train whistle blew, I pressed my hands tight to my ears and waited for what seemed like a lifetime for the sounds to die out. Invariably, when I came to dinner, someone would wonder how I managed to have traces of soil on my ears. And that's a really sad quote because it exemplifies this, the, the narrator is feeling a lot of sadness about losing their father. And the, the trains represent their father, like the, the hope that they once had. And, and, and now it's been turned on. It's 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 been turned upside down and now it represents how their father is never really coming home and so now they're just sitting under the house putting their uh hands to their ears and trying to avoid hearing the trains at all and that's that's really sad and i i think it's a it's a an emotion that i think a lot of people can resonate with like even as like toddlers as as young children as adults how we try to avoid those things that give us uncomfortable like memories of our of our parents who are long gone. Uh, so um, really good writing on on Batmiar's part and uh, really sad too. Anyway, so those are my thoughts on Overashki's Trains by Laura Vapniar. Uh, I would say it's it's a really good short story, and I urge you to go out and read some of Laura Vapniar's writing. It uh, it really touched me and uh, left me wanting more. I even looked up um, some of her uh, bibliography and, and tried to see what else she had written, and I, f- I managed to find one or two stories. So I might be checking those out pretty soon. I have a lot of a um, lot of stories to get to this year, or just in general, and. Um, I don't know if I can add another one, but I'm, I'm going to try to seek out more of her work because her prose was really good. And I figure making that like into novel a novel format, if, if she manages to capture the same atmosphere and emotion, it should be a really solid read. Uh, so if you've, if you've read Laura Vapniar's work before or you have something to say about the short story, feel free to comment below. I would love to hear from you and have a discussion about this. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that other people can find out about Laura Vapniar if they do not know already. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and trainish travels. Farewell.